exactly to freedom. John Hope Franklin, born in Oklahoma in 1915, graduated in 1935 from Fisk University. Harvard University awarded him the master's degree in 1936 and the doctorate in 1941. Dr. Franklin's awards are the Jefferson Medal of the Council for Advancement and Support of Education, the Clarence Holt Literary Prize, the Jefferson Medal of the American Philosophical Society, and the National Endowment for the Humanities Charles Franco Award presented by President Clinton in 1993. Co-writer Alfred A. Moss Jr. is an associate professor of history at the University of Maryland College Park. After completing his undergraduate work at Lake Forest College, Dr. Moss received his master's degree from the University of Chicago in 1972. He was then awarded his doctorate in 1977. A graduate of Episcopal Divinity School, he is also an Episcopal priest. In Dr. John Hope Franklin's own words, in the present work I have undertaken to bring together the essential facts in the history of the American Negro from his ancient African beginnings down to the present time. I have made a conscious effort to write the history of the Negro in America with due regard for the forces at work which have affected his development. This has involved a continuous recognition of the mainstream America history and the relationship of the Negro to it. It has been necessary, therefore, to a considerable extent to retell the story of the evolution of the people of the United States in order to place the Negro in his proper relationship and perspective. The history of the Negro in America is essentially the story of strivings of the nameless millions who have sought adjustment in a new and sometimes hostile world. This work is therefore a history of the Negro people with a proper consideration for anonymous as well as outstanding people. It is not possible to give an accurate figure of the number of slaves imported into the New World from Africa. In 1861, Edward E. Dunbar estimated that 887,500 were imported in the 16th century, 2,750,000 in the 17th century, 7 million in the 18th, and 3,250,000 in the 19th. In 1936, R. R. Kaczynski estimated that 14,650,000 Africans had been imported into the New World. In view of the great numbers that must have been killed while resisting capture, the additional numbers that died during the Middle Passage, and the millions that were successfully brought to the Americas, the aggregate approaches staggering proportions. The figures are a testimonial to the fabulous profits realized in such a sordid business, to the ruthlessness with which the traders must have pursued it, and to the tremendous demands made by New World settlers for laborers. Perhaps poet Leopold Sidar Senghor, the first president of the Republic of Senegal, best summed it up when he declared that the slave trade ravaged black Africa like a brush fire, wiping out images and values in one vast carnage. It is more difficult to measure the effect of such an activity on African life than it is to estimate the number of persons removed. The expatriation of millions of Africans in less than four centuries constitutes one of the most far-reaching and drastic social revolutions in the annals of history. And that was um, Sherry Young and Everett Alexander from the African American Shakespeare Company. Can we give them a hand? <laughs> and we'll be hearing more uh, from them later on in the program. Well, good afternoon. My name is Linda Brooks Burton, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the 19th Annual Unsung Hero Awards. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge some people that have come to acknowledge our heroes. Uh, and first of all, I'd like to uh, have you welcome our city librarian here at the San Francisco Public Library, Mr. Luis Herrera.
Thank you very much, Linda. I am absolutely delighted to be here this afternoon to um, extend my appreciation and my congratulations to the Unsung Hero uh, recipients today. Uh, we are delighted that the San Francisco Public Library is the sponsor of this event. And as you know, it started as a very small neighborhood event at one of our neighborhood libraries, the Western Edition, uh, 19 years ago. But it's turned out to be perhaps one of the most significant programs that the library has to offer and its, its sponsors. And I'm thrilled about that because libraries are about building community and going out there and responding to community needs. And this is a classic example of how wonderful uh, the partnership is with the library. Libraries represent beacons of learning. Uh, they represent opportunities for uh, youth, uh, for learning, and for success in school. And I'd like to see or believe that our youngsters can become the future heroes and leaders in our communities, thanks to many libraries in our neighborhoods. I'd also like to extend an appreciation and thanks to all of San Franciscans for recently passing successfully our Proposition D, which guarantees funding. I, I knew I'd get an applause from uh, our, our community. Uh, what does this mean? It means that we can continue to be responsive to the community. It means that we can have more books, more computers in our neighborhood branches. Uh, right now, we recently opened eight libraries with an additional day of service. Uh, this is important because we're talking about neighborhoods in the Bayview, Visitation Valley, Ocean View, areas where we really have not been as responsive as we should be, but that we're turning around and, and being more responsive to the needs in those communities. I'm also thrilled by the fact that Proposition D will allow us to continue the vision to renovate all our neighborhood branches, 17 renovations, seven new libraries, including a brand new one in Visitation Valley which is awesome. It is, it is cause for celebration uh, and an expanded, renovated library in the Bayview. We're thrilled about that. And um, I also want to take a moment to extend my appreciation, my sincere appreciation, to a very dedicated group of individuals in the library uh, that makes it all happen. They are the planning committee, the African American Services Committee here in the library. And I do want to extend my appreciation to Stuart Shaw, I know some of them are back here, but I want them to actually be acknowledged. So would you come up here if you get a moment? Uh, Linda Brooks Burton, yes. Loretta Dow, Benetta <laughs> Jackson, and Everett Alexander. So they do a fabulous job making sure that we are truly responsive to our community. So let's give them a warm welcome, folks. Great job. And last but certainly not least, my personal appreciation on behalf of the library as well to all of the, uh, the recipients of the 19th Annual Unsung Hero Celebration. Have a wonderful afternoon. This is my favorite program. I intend to stay here through the duration of it to celebrate with you. Thanks again and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Okay, just a few housekeeping tasks before we go any further. I must uh, direct you if um, there is an emergency to uh, look for the closest exit signs in the back here in the back of the auditorium as well um, and evacuate that way. But we are planning not to have one, of course. And um, also the restrooms are out the door to your right if you need to do a restroom stop. And I also like to acknowledge two other uh, important people who are here today. We're all important, but these people have come especially to acknowledge uh, our awardees. We have first um, Supervisor Tom Amiano from District 9. Please come up and say a word or two. Thank you so much. Uh, it's an honor uh, to be here and uh, looking at how everyone so beautifully turned out, especially in red. I need to apologize for my rags here, but this is grandfather duty. I just got off it, so. Uh, and uh, the thing that I always remember about the library uh, when I grew up was that it was a sanctuary. It was a place to go where you could feel safe and deal with the world when sometimes the world presented a lot of challenges. And I've always had a soft spot for the library in my heart. You know, I'm basically, have a public school teacher for many years in San Francisco. In fact, I taught uh, <coughs> at that old Bayview school that was torn down a long time ago and replaced with some very, very nice schools. Um, and as you know, the Bayview itself has uh, quite a few issues. I'm so glad that um, the head librarian is here um, at the Board of Supervisors. We, we take the libraries very, very seriously. 
And we also know from our experience uh, in the classroom and in dealing with our constituents that the ordinary becomes the extraordinary, and that's what an unsung hero is. It's someone who you usually wouldn't see in the newspaper or uh, someone uh, who would not uh, make a, a radio interview. But I always know that when there's something good happening, there's a bunch of people behind the scenes that are working hard to make that happen. Nothing just happens. And so it's with great uh, uh, respect and honor that I'm here today, and I actually have two uh, commendations, one for the, uh, uh, the African-American Center, and one for you too, sweetie, and, <laughs> and one for the African-American Center of the San Francisco Public Library, and what this uh, commendations say, <coughs> Certificate of Honor Board of Supervisors, the Board of Supervisors of the City and County of San Francisco, hereby issues and authorizes the execution of the Certificate of Honor in appreciative public rec recognition of distinction and merit for outstanding services to a significant portion of the people and city of San Francisco for its significant contributions to the community and its sponsorship of the 19th annual Unsung Heroes Award celebration from slavery to freedom, honoring historian John Hope Franklin, the Board of Supervisors extends its highest commendation to the African American Center at the library and the African American Center. So congratulations, everyone. Thank you again. And next, I'd like to invite um, Rose Chung, who is the legislative assistant for Supervisor Aaron Peskin from District 3 to come up. Thank you very much, Linda. On behalf of the President of the Board of Supervisors, um, I'm really happy to be here and express appreciation and congratulations to all the amazing and selfless individuals who's uh, given their heart and soul to the community to make it have a better quality of life and um, for um, all the wonderful work that you do. So I have these certificates to give to Linda to present to each of the unsung heroes. Congratulations to all of you. Okay. For the past five years, the themes of our Unsung Hero programs have come from the founders of Black History Month, that is the Association for the Study of African American Life, which was the brainchild of Carter G. Woodson. This year's Black History theme is dedicated to the struggles of people of African descent to achieve freedom and equality in the Americas during the Age of Emancipation. Over a half a century ago, the celebrated historian, John Hope Franklin, identified the struggle for slavery and freedom as the central theme of African American history. We take up this theme to honor him and our heroes, whom you will be learning about today. John Hope Franklin pioneered the study of the African American experience. Franklin's first book, The Free Negro in North Carolina, appeared in 1943 but it remains the standard work on its subject and a key reference point for those investigating the status of free African Americans before the Civil War. At the time he wrote this work, historians were devoting little or no attention to what was then called Negro history. Almost no scholarly work existed on antebellum free blacks. In 1947, Franklin published From Slavery to Freedom, A History of African Americans, widely considered to be the definitive work on the subject. This great work is now in its eighth edition and has been translated into Indian, Japanese, German, French, Portuguese, and Chinese. This year marks the 60th anniversary of From Slavery to Freedom and serves as the official theme for Black History Month this year, as well as our theme for the 19th Annual Unsung Hero Awards. Now I want you to sit back, relax, because I can assure you that you will be touched and inspired by what you will experience here today. Each of our heroes has a unique story of unselfish service to others in the African American community and a willingness to give their time and energy to make life better for others. Now is our time to thank them. With that, I'd like to introduce the Vukani Mwethu Choir, who will begin our program with the national the Negro National Anthem, and I'd like the audience to stand as we do that. Please welcome them.
You were good. Come join the good. Fantastic. so you can join in with us.
Kanye Mwetu. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stuart Shaw. I'm the African American Center Librarian here at the Main Library, and thanks for coming to the 19th Annual Unsung Heroes. I am here to introduce our MC for the day, Veronica Dangerfield. Veronica Dangerfield, let me read this here, is an award-winning speaker, trainer, comedian, and performance artist who has been performing throughout the Bay Area since 1994. She has appeared as MC for the Unsung Heroes for the past, I think, eight or nine years now, so without her, we couldn't do this program. Veronica has written, directed, produced, and performed in her own autobiographical play entitled Unidentified, the story of a, her childhood growing up in Japan. Actually, she performed it here at the library as well a couple years back. She is the founder of Comedy for Community, a showcase that provides family comedy to raise funds for nonprofit organizations. Veronica's mission in life, she says, is to empower, uplift, and encourage people on their quest toward the greater vision of themselves to manifest their dreams. Veronica Dangerfield. Hello, cousins. <laughs> and I would like to say to you today, Ashe. Can I hear an Ashe? Ashe. Now, don't y'all sit there and act like this ain't a celebration, because we are going to have some fun today. Can I hear Ashe? Ashe. All right, cousins, I want you to turn to your neighbor and tell them how wonderful you look today. Take 30 seconds. Yes, cousins, my name is Veronica Dangerfield, and yes, I am Rodney's only black child. <laughs> Woo, but we're going to get some respect here today. The respect part, that ain't me. You know what? Success is a little li like wrestling a gorilla. You don't quit when you're tired. You quit when the gorilla gets tired. We are going to see some people today that have tirelessly and effortlessly produced wonderful things in our community. And I'm telling you, there's going to be a tide wave and a ripple of ashes all across this audience. And I'm warning you, if you don't stay awake, I'm going to have to tell some jokes. And then everybody will be so, like my grandmama used to say. We have another distinguished visitor here today. We have Sophie Maxwell from District Trend. Put your hands together, cousin. And please welcome her to the stage. Well, thank you so much. And it is a great pleasure that I'm here today. And I really appreciate people doing this because it's so often that we think about heroes as the people who do the not so often big huge things but it's really not that it's the people who do the small things every day the people who are consistent the people you can depend on and who are committed and who help us in so many ways so i want to thank you it's the people i and just who, who volunteer in my office it's those volunteers who, who do things and go to hospitals and, the, and who make the churches really, really work. So again, thank you all for all that you do. Thank you for deciding to recognize the unsung heroes. This is a great day and a great day of celebration. And the thing is, is we can all be unsung heroes, all of us, every day of our lives. Thank you. I would like to even go a step further and recognize that every single one of you sitting in your chairs are unsung heroes. So I say to you cousins, Ashe. And keep on doing what you're doing. And speaking of Renaissance woman, I'd like to talk to you about a person. Her name is Mary L. Booker. Miss Booker, are you here? Oh, Miss Booker, you are so wonderful. Because let me tell you, you know, when you talk about Ms. Booker, you have to have a really wide vocabulary, okay? Because there's only a few words that, the words that she has is wonderful. We talk about passionate. We talk about deeply committed. 
not committed like I am in Napa, but deeply committed to her community. <laughs> We're talking she's spiritual, she's intelligent, and she is a thespian. She was nominated by Verna L. Howard, and at San Francisco State University, she majored in theatrical arts. Now, her mother knew that about her before she actually got to the university. <laughs> that was a joke, you guys, come on. <laughs> Y'all gotta help me out here, you know? Because you're gonna hear some profound things today, but m most of them are not gonna be coming from me, okay? I am the lighthearted, frivolous part of the of the program. Well, anyway, she's not only a director, she's a playwright. She did Upon This Rock. It was the first major production about prejudiceism within the black community. Can I hear an ashe? Right. She believes that community-based theater has a responsibility for the community. You know what? I think that without theater, Life is like a crayon box. There's only five crayons in there. But when you bring the arts in it, theater and music, you got a box of 120 crayons. Can I hear an ashe? All right. She's groomed a generation of playwrights and artists at the Bayview. She's part of the Opera House Ruth Memorial Theater. She is an active member of Providence Baptist Church. Is Providence Baptist Church in the house? All right, but what I like about, this is what I was really excited about. She's an organizer of single ministries. So if any of y'all single out there, look it up with Miss Booker, okay? She is the co-founder of Infinity Productions. She's tireless, she's beautiful, and as the kids say, she's awesome. Come on up, Miss Booker, and take your award as an unsung hero. you on the microphone so we can get you on TV. Miss okay, <laughs> <laughs> Booker, one more time. <laughs> You know what, I really thought seriously about um, what should I say? And I went back through some of my work and I found something I wrote in 1979. I know that's a long time ago. But I think it kind of says what I really want to say to all of you uh, this afternoon. There was a concert in our community at Providence Baptist Church where we presented one of our chancel choir members in, choir, in a concert. Her name was Andrea Green. After the concert, I was so moved, I wrote, there was a happening in Bayview Hunters Point today. A gala crowd paused for a moment to hear the singing of Andrea. And I believe that the Lord God Almighty looked down with pride as her clear, crisp voice from him was energized. Spirit, knowledge, a sense of our historical past, all of this was integrated for this I was glad. Her soprano range was a delight to the ear as it with ease floated out, filling the air. Paraglacy, Giordani, Scaletti, Rossini, Puccini, and Gershwin too. An awestruck crowd, she with authority led them through. But I truly knew she'd hit a stride, singing from Roots, Quince's Ishe Aloha. 
many rains ago, she reminded us with pride of our great musical heritage that has stood the test of times. Part three was very important to me. Hearing her unfold our musical history, singing the works of Johnson, Price, and Burley, sing, Andrea, sing. Our hearts cried out as she, spirit filled, began to sing the works of Walter Hawkins and James Cleveland. We began to shout, sing, Andrea, sing. I went away feeling that Bayview Hunters Point will never be the same again because God in all of his wisdom had shown us that to a community, to a world, each individual can make a difference by just letting Andrea sing. You know, it's always, it's always funny to me when people come up and say, I didn't know what to say, and then they speak so eloquently. <laughs> it's like, are you sure you was talking about yourself? <laughs> Gee whiz, Miss Booker. <laughs> Shoot, we have to hook up afterwards. You need to give me some lessons. <laughs> Legends are made of ordinary people who do extraordinary deeds. Legends are not limited to sports heroes and celebrities. We all have the potential to be legends. And speaking of legends, let me tell you about An Lee. This is an amazing individual. He works with seniors with disability and education and training our communities on organizing senior empowerment. If you believe in senior empowerment, say, ah, shay. When I was younger, I lived in uh, Tokyo, Japan. And when I got back to Texas, nobody understood what language I was speaking. But you know what? I found the seniors. They always had money, and they had a great sense of humor. <laughs> so I'm into senior power now. He, knew, he taught them how to conduct an effective meeting he talks about public speaking, diversity, along with many aspects of leadership. He is the outreach specialist for the Network of Elders, an organization based in Bayview Hunters Point, which serves seniors and persons with disability. Now, I have to hear some ashes coming from the audience. I mean, disabilities and seniors, these are our people he's serving. I'm gonna have to go to Starbucks for y'all. <laughs> Wake up. <laughs> All right. Okay, and he, um, he is an amazing resource for all of us. He's responsible for the outreach for the Network of Elder Resource Center at the Bayview Hunter Point, Visitation Valley, Portola, Excelsior Communities, and Ocean View, which means that he's all over San Francisco. Can I hear an ashe? Because I'm going to work until the cows come home. Y'all going to stay with me today. So please put a warm welcome for Mr. An Lee. He's amazing. An Lee. Thank you so much for that generous introduction, Ms. Veronica. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, uh, good afternoon uh, young men and young women in the audience. And good afternoon, uh, all you beautiful children, girls, and boys. It is so wonderful to see each and every one of you here. And as has been said already, you, each of you and every one of you are indeed the unsung heroes. And it moves me quite deeply, ladies and gentlemen, to see all the young people in the audience with your parents, your grandparents, your family members, your aunties, your neighbors. It moves me quite deeply in all of us. Uh, 
I feel very deeply honored to be, uh, to be receiving this award, ladies and gentlemen. And um, I want, first of all, to thank each and all of you who are here. And I want also to uh, pay my respect and thanks to Ms. Uh, Linda Brooks Burton and her wonderful staff at the Bayview Library. I just want to share with you a story. Uh, I've gone to the Bayview Public Library a number of times and in fact recently had an informational table at the Public Library where we uh, provide information for uh, folks in the community and seniors and persons with disabilities. Uh, so to let people know of resources. And you know what, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to share with you that Ms. Brooks Burton and her wonderful staff there are so dedicated and so professional. And that library is filled with young people in addition to adults. And that's beautiful. That's beautiful. I also want to acknowledge, ladies and gentlemen, uh, a number of people in the audience here who were in the senior university class sessions that were held in the Bayview and Hunters Point in July of 2006, as well as senior university class sessions that were held at Jones Memorial United Methodist Church in the Western Edition uh, this past spring. And I would like to acknowledge a number of people and ask you to please stand. Uh, first of all, uh, in terms of seniority here, uh, Miss Ruth Dark, a leader in the Bayview community. Her daughter, Miss Barry, next to her. Another leader, not only in the Bayview, but throughout San Francisco. Another leader in the Bayview and throughout San Francisco, Miss Ann Horvath. A dedicated volunteer and leader in uh, different programs involving seniors in the Bayview, in Hunters Point, in the Western Edition, and throughout San Francisco, a Vietnamese American elderly person, Miss Hui Thi Chung. <laughs> Miss Barry Mary Booker. A wonderful leader in the Bayview, articulate, very verbal, Miss Viola Whitehead. Ashe. I also want to mention to you, ladies and gentlemen, that Miss Whitehead goes to all these rallies and yes. protest campaigns and hearings at the Board of Supervisors at City Hall with her beautiful and loving sister, Miss Shirley Blaine, who could not be with us today. So we think of Shirley. Hello, Shirley. She's at home today, Shirley. And uh, also in the back, Miss uh, Ethel Eng. And I know, I know my time is up, uh, ladies and gentlemen, but I want to share with you a real quick story, real quick story. Uh, it's about one of the things that the seniors in the Bayview and Hunters Point did, which teaches all of us a lesson. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to introduce you to Miss Ernestine Patterson, a leader in the Western Edition. <laughs> Miss Patterson. Thank you, Miss Patterson. A real quick story, and ladies and gentlemen, and all the young people listen to the story. It's about what the seniors in the Bayview and Hunters Point did last year. Uh, we, the seniors and I identified some of the major issues and problems the community faces. And one of the top problems the seniors identified was this one supermarket in the Bayview on William Street called Foodsco Supermarket. They were selling spoiled and rotten foods to the community spoiled and rotten, stuff you could not feed to anybody, and they were selling it. The seniors and I decided to wage a big protest campaign against Foodsco. The seniors planned a demonstration at Foodsco. Placard signs that they wrote stood there. The manager of the 
supermarket came out, Mr. Klontz, he quickly dashed back in. After the protest was over, the seniors followed him back into the store, politely, professionally requested him to meet with the seniors. The security guard came out and said, no way, he will not talk with you. He will not talk with you. The seniors say, said to them, we want to talk with him. We're here. We want to talk with him. He had no choice but to come out to meet with the seniors. The seniors waged a campaign. They wrote news articles that were published in community newspapers, including the San Francisco Bayview. Uh, they wrote letters to the mayor, to the board of supervisors, to Supervisor Max Maxwell, so on and so forth. They form a committee to monitor the issue. And you know what? They not only confronted the big corporation called Foodsco Supermarket in Southern California, they also stood up to the giants like Ralph's Market, Kayla Market, and one of the biggest corporations in the US, Kroger's Corporation. They were not afraid. And you know what? The store had to clean up their act. They haven't done everything right yet, but they surely have done a lot of cleaning up. So ladies and gentlemen, let's salute the seniors of the Bayview and Hunters Point. Thank you. I tell you, the, the rebels of the world are not the teenagers anymore. It's the seniors. Somebody got to control those people. I just think it's wonderful. Let's have another Ashe for the seniors. Ashe. <laughs> and now I'm going to introduce a wonderful woman, Cheryl Davis, because you know, for Cheryl Davis, faith is not a belief. Faith is believing in the truth and holding up the truth when the entire world is focused and, and continues to deny its existence. Faith is the soul of living a spiritual life. Ashe, cousins. Faith is absolute conviction. Faith is undaunted, unrelentless, and unmoved. Now, if faith was a category in the Olympics, what would Miss Davis get? Would she get the bronze? Would she get the silver? Not only would she bring home the gold, they'd have to make a new category for her. They'd have to give her the platinum. The platinum. Come on, Miss Smith. Thank you. So Cheryl Davis, she is. Uh, she has a bachelor's in early childhood education. She's working on her graduate degree. She's the mother of a son. She is wife of Reverend Henry L. Davis. Yeah. It must be nice being married to a spiritual man because you can throw the Bible at him. <laughs> she's tireless, she's a tireless community activist, and she's beautiful. Welcome, Miss Davis. Um, you know, I have to say, I'm really grateful and honored by the opportunity to receive this award, but as we were sitting here today, because in order to do the work that I do in the community for folks who know that work, it really requires all day, all night. And I have to just first off say off the top, you know, my husband and I were joking about it and he said to make sure I acknowledged him, but <laughs> um, in, in all honesty, the time that my husband and my son have to do without me in order for me to work in the community is grand and great. And I appreciate them allowing me to stay gone so long to work with other people's families. And, and by that same token, as I was sitting here, sometimes you get so engrossed in the work and you sometimes you feel like it's not really you don't know, you begin to question whether it's worth it and you don't know if it's making a difference. But as I was sitting there and watching people come in, my heart was so touched because 
it's not the work of one. It's really not. It requires not just your family, but the extended family. And in order to be able to impact and make a difference in the community, it takes the community. And I was so moved and so touched by seeing my extended family. And I'm just going to really ask them to stand up right now, because sometimes I don't know that they appreciate it. So I wanted to really ask my church family to stand up and to thank them for coming out and showing me. In all honesty, this, war, this, this award goes to them because in order to make it happen and to do it, I require that everybody has to have all hands on deck and I don't have the money to pay these people. So um, I, I really, I appreciate it so much. The work that we've done, the ability to really say that church is bigger than just Sunday morning, that it's really about going out and doing ministry and not being alone and saying that we really need to, in order to make a difference in the community, we have to be in the community. We can't wait for the community to come to the church. We have to go into the community and do the work. And through their efforts, we've been able to take this work beyond religion and beyond faith, but really into the hearts of the people to say that somebody cares for you beyond saying that we're counting numbers or we're trying to prove that we have some ability. It's really about one, for the sake of one, for the sake of one child, for the sake of one soul, for the sake of one person. And so for this, again, I say thank you, but it's really not about me. It's about making a difference. Thank you. Hey, cousins, love is an action verb. If you base everything you do, if you think love is a feeling, you would think that love was just like Bay Area traffic. It's always bad. Sometimes it's good on holidays and late at night. But love is an action verb. Y'all finally laughing at my jokes here, sufficiently warmed up. Um, I'd like to talk about someone who has touched my heart immediately just because of her name, Dr. Veronica Honeycutt. But, but let me tell you about the Dr. Honeycutt. See, Dr. Honeycutt understood that it's easy to settle for average and to strive for achievement. She understood that it's easier to be saturated with complacency than stirred with passion. It's easier to question than to conquer. It's easier to rationalize your disappointments than realize your dreams. It's easier to belch the baloney than bring home the bacon. <laughs> but not Dr. Veronica Honeycutt. She was nominated by Johnetta Richards, Kelly Armstrong, and Linda Richardson. Ashe. <laughs> She is a faculty member at City College of San Francisco since 1972. I know, 1972? She must have been a prodigy, because she surely must have been a child. She's held positions as a dean of the Southeast Campus, the acting deans of students, the chair of African American Study. She's a member of the Mayor's Citizen Advisory Commission the Housing Production Advisory Board, the San Francisco Mental Health Association, where I think I'll see her sometimes. <laughs> Whoa, it's Looney Tunes up here, folks. Um, and she's also at the Bayview YMCA. I don't understand when she has time to sleep. This woman is vice president of the OMI Community Association. She's the current president of the Visitation Valley Community Center Board of Directors. Oh, I gotta take a breath. She's also who's who among teachers in 1997 and 1998, and you would also be who's who's for me eternally. We don't have to give you a year. You're always who's who's, all right, all whatever right. that means. She's been honored by KQED, by Kaiser, by the Union Bank, and now she has been honored by the San Francisco Public Library Unsung Committee, welcome Dr. Veronica Honeycutt.
Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right. To whom much is given, much is expected. All right. Now, I want you to know, I started to uh, tell you about a devotional that piece that I read this morning from Ephesians 2.10. Okay. I'm going to do it anyway. It is, it is God himself who has made us what we are and given us new lives through Christ Jesus. And long ages ago, he planned that we should spend these lives in helping others. All right. All right. And let me tell you something. My background is this. I was born in Sacramento, California, raised in San Francisco in the Fillmore. I remember Littleman's, Honorado. You said you have to go way back into Western Edition history to understand. Mary Rogers, Toshi Koba, Yori Wada. These are the people with whom I had an opportunity to be mentored and who was, I was loved by, OK? And I want you to know something else. I grew up in a family that did not have a lot of money. Uh, but let me tell you, my family had the right values. They loved yes. God. Yes. They valued an education. It was no playing in the streets for me, young people who are in the audience. It was when I got home from school. It was about going and having my dinner. It was about doing my homework. It was about taking care of business because my folks let me know that I stood on the shoulders of elders who came before me. And they had more than paid the price for me. I want you to understand that. That's the kind of rich history I came from. They sacrificed deeply for me. They made sure that I sat in the front seat to see people like Joshua Heifetz to see the uh, flamenco, Jose Greco Flamenco Theater, because they wanted me to dream a world which was beyond my immediate reality. And they knew that there were options available for me, and they wanted me to be aware of that. I would like to thank the African American Interest Committee and the African American Center of the San Francisco Public Library and that wonderful woman, Linda Burton, yeah. for honoring me today. When you honor me, you are also giving special recognition to the other organizations I represent. Now, my namesake, Veronica, listed some of the organizations that I've you know, <laughs> been fortunate to uh, uh, work with in the past. But you honor the Southeast Campus of City College of San Francisco. <laughs> you honor the neighborhoods that we service. Bayview Hunters Point, Visitation Valley, some sections of Terrell Hill, and to be honest with you, the whole, the whole city uh, for some of our specialty programs. You honor the San Francisco Parks Trust, of which I am a board uh, a member. Uh, it is true that I am the president of the Visitation Valley Community Center. We have plenty of work out there. Anytime you have a neighborhood where there were nine murders in three days, 65-year-old Asian-American man who was carjacked and killed. A community that is trying to get through that pain. We have our work ahead of us. Now, we at the college have some ESL programs out there. We've experienced a downturn because people are afraid to go out. So there's plenty of work for us to do. And those who, of you who live out there who want to join in, please do work with us. You also honor the Bayview Hunters Point <laughs> Lions Club. And I saw Fran, our membership chair, I don't know if she's still here. There she is. Watch out for her because she'll get you to sign up for uh, the Bayview Hunters Point Lion Club, a new club we have set as our goal to raise $100,000 for scholarships for young people in the Bayview Hunters Point area. <laughs> uh, I want to thank the three powerhouse ladies who nominated me, and they are titans in and of themselves. Dr. Janetta Richards, uh, who is a uh, faculty member at both City College of San Francisco and San Francisco State. Please pray for her. She uh, became ill, had to have surgery, and is no, not going to be working until January of next year. Wonderful woman. Please uh, keep her in your prayers. Uh, I would like you to honor, and uh, I want you to see Kelly Armstrong. Please stand up, Kelly. <laughs> this lady's dynamic, articulate, passionate. She is presently collaborating with me and Dr. Jones from San Francisco State to start the Hospitality 
uh, management and culinary high school mentoring program, we are determined that there will be more African American people in the culinary industry. Hospitality is a big piece. And some of the folks are saying they can't find African Americans, but we've heard that before and we know better. So we're going to work on that. And last but not least, this wonderful woman whom you all know, Commissioner Linda Richardson. Please stand up, Linda. <laughs> Linda has served on more boards and for more mayors than I can even keep up with. But let me tell you, this sister is not about play. She is about, I hear you up in here saying, mm-hmm. She is wise, she's politically savvy, and, and she is a real advocate for the communities in, in, in general, but in particular, Bayview Hunters Point. Okay, um, I've lost track. I'd, I'd also like to thank, I'm, I'm gonna close it. I'd also <laughs> like to thank my immediate family who could not be with me today due to illness and college obligations, but who are here, here in spirit. And I wanna thank members of my church family. I see Garth in the back, thank you Garth. I see Tina, sis, uh, from, uh, and, and Lois Colbert from Glad Tidings. Uh, I, they are part of what allows me to do what I do. Uh, we are the beneficiaries of the legacy given to us by Dr. John Hope Franklin, Gwendolyn Brooks, Carter G. Woodson, Bell Hooks, Ralph Ellison, Miriam Makiba, Dr. Asa Hilliard, that giant of a man who passed away recently, um, Claude McKay, just to name a few. And I want you to, I'm, 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 I'm going to tell you this. We're starting a new program, spring 2008. I am determined my staff, my faculty and my staff, and in fact, there's another lady here from our uh, high school program, uh, Melody Martin. Are you still there? Melody's right there. She works in our high school program doing a very difficult job of getting students through high school. But I want you to know we're starting a new program, spring 2008. We, it's called the Weekend College. We, are, we want high school young people as well as the other folks in the community to take college credit courses. If they start with us in the 11th grade, by the time they graduate from high school, they will have accomplished 36 units of college credit. They will have a foot in the door. As long as God keeps breath in my body, I am going to continue to do those things which will bring students the skill sets, the uh, academic uh, dispositions, whatever it takes for them to be successful in the, at the academy. Thank you very much. You know, it ain't easy being cheesy. <laughs> and I tell you, I get to be from Wisconsin. Cousins, you have a very, very special treat. First of all, I would like to acknowledge Anybody here that is a parent of any child, I want you to raise your hand and give yourself a applause. Because let me tell you, being a parent is one of the most difficult things that you can ever do because the learning and the teaching never stops. And not only that, it's sometimes you know you can have a full moon in your head and sometimes it's a total eclipse up there. And you got kids are expecting you to give leadership. Now, we've got some beautiful kids here today. We've got the S.R. Martin Praise Dancers. Now, cousins, I want you to give them all your attentions. I want you to give them ashes. I want you to clap for them, because this is the future of America coming up here. So stay with them now. Come on, kids, come on up. They're all here. One more time, cousins. Give them a hand.
not only could you hear the music, but you could feel it in your soul, couldn't you? Give one more applause for the SR Martin. And if you were listening to the song, Cousins, it said that you were put here to be blessed. How many of you believe that? Ah, Shay. Well, not only are you going to be blessed with a powerful program today, we are going to feed you afterwards. You are going to be a blessed with abundant, satiating, delicious food. Can I hear an ashe? And if you check in your pockets and you don't have your phone, I have it. And if you don't retrieve it soon, I'm making a call to Tokyo. Got some friends there. Dr. Martin Luther King said, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. He said, I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. Did y'all hear me? I said, Ashe out there? OK, and you can never be what you ought to be until I am what I ought to be. This is the day the world is made. I didn't make it that way, but this is the interrelated structure of reality. Do you believe, each and every one of you, that love is eternal? Yes. Did you know that love never dies? Yes. It changes a little bit. It transforms a little bit. But the good that you do on this planet never leaves. And the love that you put in your heart is there forever. Can I hear an ashe? So I want to talk about Mr. Jimmy Wilson, Jr. Although he is not here, like the butterfly effect, yes. his love still wraps us up. In glorious rapture, can I hear an Ashe cousin? He was nominated by Ronald Colehurst. He, is, he was an advocate and a volunteer for mental health, education, jobs, and affordable housing. It was a circle. He did everything. In 1990, he became the president of the Sunnydale Housing Project Tenant Association and established a tenant resource center. He co-founded the Bayview's Hunters Point Foundation to provide mental health services to the community. And if you don't think we need mental health services, you need to take a look around. He partnered with HUD to establish the Jackie Robinson Computer Learning Center. Because you know what? Well, there's only two types of people in this world now, the information rich and the information poor. If you don't know how to get to the information, it don't matter how much money you have. He served as the president of the Southeast Housing Development Corporation until his death in April of 2007. God bless his soul. He was a volunteer in the community by working with churches, directing homeless to various social services. He provided um, turnkey and toys to Jackie Robinson's residents during the holidays, and he supported such organization as the United Negro College Fund, because a mind is a terrible thing to waste. If you got kids, you really know that's true. <laughs> he is, his, this award will be accepted by his beautiful daughter, Latresha Wilson Alford. Please come accept the award on behalf of your wonderful dad. Um, first, I'd like to give honor to God. It's still really difficult for me. <laughs> because my dad passed away in March, so it's really difficult. I want to ask my family members to please stand. Uh, my brother, Andre Wilson, <laughs> and Linda, my girlfriend, um, Daryl Hatchett, my daughter, Justice, I see Mary back there. And here's my mom, Ernestine Wilson. Yeah. Um, my brother, um, Jimmy Wilson, is not here. He's hurt his back. And my brother, Devin Wilson, isn't here. And my um, two daughters, Nicole and Alicia, they're currently in college. One is attending um, Hampton University in Virginia. And the other one is, <laughs> and the other one is at Central State in um, Ohio, in Wilberforce. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would also like to thank the committee 
and um, the San Francisco Public Library, and also my friend Ronald Coulter, is, is he here? For not, there's Ronald in the back, um, for nominating um, my dad. Um, as we honored James Weldon Johnson, I also remembered um, my dad telling me that he attended school with another great historian, um, Lerone Bennett, and um, they were kids, they used to play together. Uh, one thing that, uh, that my dad really believed in was for um, economic empowerment and also he, uh, it may not have been mentioned, but he was, not only did he find the, or start the Computer Learning Center at Jackie Robinson, he actually, he and George Williams, if any of you all remember that name, and some of his friends um, went to Washington, D.C. and received a HUD grant and they actually built and developed the Jackie Robinson Garden Apartments. So whenever I'm at home and I drive by my parents' home, I, I remember my dad when I see Jackie Robinson because he believed in affordable housing for black people. And at the time, there was a struggle that African Americans were having in San Francisco and everywhere um, to find affordable housing. He and my mom worked, and other people in the community to work to provide not only uh, rental, nice rentals, but also help people get into their first homes in San Francisco, and he believed in job development. He worked for the Urban League, so it's just, um, just a wonderful thing for you all to recognize him. He never was recognized for any of his work while he was living but he's been recognized twice this month, um, Dr. Williams and Baby Hunters Point um, Senior Center um, had a uh, luncheon and recognized him um, the other day. So I know he's, he's happy for everything you guys are giving. And he was a member of Providence Missionary right. Baptist Church. <laughs> My family and I are so honored for this opportunity Jimmy and I never thought this day would come. Right. We had 50 years together. Sometimes, sometimes I didn't have food for him giving away stuff to somebody else. And I said, Jimmy, what are we going to do? So I'm grateful, I'm thankful, and God bless each and every one of you for thinking about the people in Bayview Hunters Point and all of you, and let's continue to care about people, care about these children, and do our best. Thank you very much. That's wonderful. Few can touch the magic streams, and noisy fame is proud to win them. Alas, for the ones that never sing but die with the music in them. But we have another unsung hero, and she's not dying with the music in her, because the music is strong and loud. Huey Triong. Huey is originally from Vietnam, where she worked in the field of education. 32 years ago, she immigrated to the United States. She has a daughter, two sons, two granddaughters, and a great-granddaughter. Christy, right? Where's Christy at? Hi, Christy. <laughs> Her community involvement includes a senior level volunteer worker, citywide organizational working to improve the lives of San Francisco seniors and other city residents. She's very dedicated to working with the senior university classes, and she's doing it bilingually. Can I have an ashe? Ashe. Because it ain't easy speaking English, OK? <laughs> You throw a couple of few more languages in there, it gets really difficult. She is a speaker. She's at the senior leader campaign protester against the Food Co supermarket. She's one of the protesters, okay? <laughs> we need to get a restraining order on the seniors. They're just getting too wild. <laughs> she believes that the value and riches of cultural diversity promotes a common ground for shared humanity. Ah, Shay. Her philosophy on life is to live life with kindness, love, and to share it with everyone you meet. Thank you, Miss Yui Triong. Please come up and get your award, honey. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much for this, our, I feel deep life or no. I work, I love working for good people. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Too tall. I love you both at all. She was the fastest speaker yet. <laughs> it's like, whoa. Uh, is Miss Gail Smith here? Miss Gail Smith. All righty. So I want to talk about the light bulb. Has anybody seen a light bulb lately? All light bulbs give off light. Would you agree? Yes or no? But does a 20 watt light bulb give off more than a 60 watt light bulb? No, not even close. But well, revolution came when they had the halogen lights. The two people I'm going to talk about, Maddie Scott and George Duran, I think I need to. When I looked at them, their light was so bright, I almost had to go to my purse and take out my sunglasses. When these two people walk around, you got to have your sunscreen in your purse because the light is so bright. And as the day go by, the light gets even brighter and brighter. Now, let me tell you about Miss, Miss Maddie Scott, because I don't think the woman sleeps. She's a member of the NAACP. She worked with Amos C. Brown on, on, in the Friday Night Live. She's an ordained men, deacon of the Third Baptist Church. Baptist, Third Baptist, Third Pass. She worked with the Agape Outreach Housing Program with the late Mary Rogers. She started a prison missionary ministry that reached Vacaville, San Quentin, and San Bruno jails. Because we cannot be defined by our worst act. We're all beautiful from the inside out, perfect spiritually. Now, we're going to make some mistakes. But just because you're in prison does not mean that you do not need love. And Maddie Scott recognized this. God bless you, Maddie. She's a organized the community um, block. Is that a party? And you didn't invite me? I got to keep an eye on her. She worked for both Willie Brown and Mayor Newsom's campaign. She worked with Proposition A to stop homicide now. Ashe Cousins? Ashe. All right. She helped to organize the San Francisco Eight, and her mission is to stop the violence. And then she organized the Cease for Peace to get guns off the street. Ashe. Ashe. Now, you got a dual pack. This is a double dynamite package here, because George is along with her. These people were nominated by Jane Redmond. Judy Hughes, and Cur Curlin Alexander. Now, he's also a member of the NAACP, and he looks very good in his suit, <laughs> I must add. He's a, he's a member of the Men's Breakfast Club, the Layman's Department at Paradise Baptist Church. He's his Brother's Keepers organization. That's a good one. I am my Brother's Keeper. Might as well make an organization out of it. <laughs> He is the operation manager of the San Francisco Sheriff's Department program Road to Recovery, a successful relapse prevention program to resolve the Stop the Violence Project at a nationally recognized violent prevention program. Ah, oh, shame, Mr. <laughs> now this, okay, cousin, this is my favorite part, okay. He is a certified restorative justice trainer substance abuse counselor, relapse prevention specialist, domestic violence counselor, adult education teacher, and conflict resolution tra trainer. 
Wow! Women, if he was single, you need to marry this man. He knows how to do everything. Please welcome Maddie Scott and George Durand. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Right. Praise the Lord. Right, George and I uh, do this work um, 24 hours a day, and it's just not us um, that does the work. Um, as Cheryl D Davis has said, we all work in a community together throughout the Bay Area, and um, we have some people behind us. First of all, I have my mother, who's 85 years old, who instilled many values in me, and who taught me um, how to do this work as a young child um, in New Orleans during the Civil Rights Movement. Um, I have my daughter, I have my grandchildren, I have four generations in the audience, and my friends. And above all, we have the Healing Circle for the Soul Support Group. Would you stand up, please? These are all the mothers and fathers who have lost children to senseless gun violence. And I don't know if you read the paper yesterday, but one of our mothers, Judy Hughes, whose son is being accused of murdering um, his best friends in Clear Lake, who's doing time, we got, because of the efforts and her prayers and her faith and because of the healing circle and because of you and your prayers, we have a change of venue from Clear Lake County <laughs> as of yesterday. That is what the Healing Circle does. We're in the business for God. We're in the business of healing souls. We're in the business of helping those that are incarcerated. When you do it to the least of these, you have done it unto me, thus says the Lord. And we are about the business of kingdom building. And we can only do that with each other, embracing each other, you know, loving one another, putting our arms around our young people. And the Healing Circle is very proud to receive this award from the San Francisco Public Library. Here's George. <laughs> it's a hard act to follow, but I just want to say thank you. I'm not in it for awards. I keep my baby daughter and my firstborn son in my mind because they're gone with the Lord. And I want to thank my son and my daughter here. And the only one I miss is my little grandbaby, little Bam Bam. Because she'd be up here, Grandpa, Grandpa, can we see Shrek? So I bought a Shrek 3. There's a few of my colleagues here, and I want to acknowledge them. I want to thank the Sheriff's Department and Michael Hennessy for allowing me to do the work. And I want to thank you, because there's something for you to do as well. Yes. So everybody's an unsung hero. Yes. And you don't have to look far to see that there's a problem in our America, in this world today, to just step out on faith and say, what can I do? And that's what it's really all about. What can you do? And we can all do something. And I just want to leave you with this. Precious Lord, take my hand and lead me on. Let me stand, I am tired, I am weak, I am worn through the storm, through the night. Lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord. Lead me home.
Healing Circle for the Soul Support Group thanks you for this honorary award. God bless you all. I told you he was a whole package. <laughs> then he started singing. It's like, oh, that quenched it. <laughs> okay, success, Charles Lindbergh said that success is not measured by, why, by, by, by what a man accomplishes, but by the opposition that he's encountered and the courage in which he maintains the struggle against overwhelming odds. I am so happy, cousins to announce the next unsung hero because he's always been a hero to me, Mr. Walter Johnson. Uh, me, and, me and Linda and, and Mr. Johnson go way back because we were the first inhabitants at Bayview Community, at Bayview um, Hunters Point. They built some new condos out there. And, uh, we were the trendsetters because we were the first ones there and it was right across from the projects. And everybody thought that it was gonna be a disaster because here we are, middle class people in the projects, but that's what the projects is. Middle class people working hard, <laughs> right? <laughs> but Walter has this big old fat shining soul when you look at him, you can feel the energy coming from him. He's one happy camper. He hasn't told me which medication he's on, but I'm gonna ask him later. He's the oldest of seven children. He graduated from Southern Illinois University in 1973 with a BS degree in criminal justice administration. <laughs> That's, okay, I won't go there. He was retired. <laughs> He's, a, he's a retired as a probation officer after 23 years, and he's been drinking from the fountain of youth, because look how good he looks. He is the single father of a beautiful girl, April Johnson, and she graduated from college. Any man who's a single parent who graduated a child is an unsung hero for me. I'm telling you, the man is busy. He's, been, he's the board of directors for the um, Buchanan YMCA and the Midnight Basketball Program. Because if they're going to play basketball, let them play all night long, OK? Because then you know they ain't doing nothing else. He's the board of directors on Infusion One. He's a guest speaker at um, Providence Baptist Church and the Rainbow Seven Day Adventist Church. He's a treasurer for the capital fundraiser for the Bayview Opera House. Save the Bayview Opera House. Save it. We need to keep the arts in our community. He's a tutor. He's a volunteer. He's currently the public relations facilitator at the Bayview Hunters Point Drama Group in, co in collaboration with the Bayview Opera House. He's worked tirelessly coming to the aid of anyone needing assistance, and he expects nothing in return. And he, I tell you, I had to listen to him complain because he did not want to accept an award today. He did not want to be an unsung hero, but let's really embarrass him. Let's clap him and welcome him up here. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I, I want to give thanks to uh, the San Francisco Library um, I want to thank Linda Burton Brooks, and, and I want to give thanks to the readers of the applications, uh, the two people in the back. They, they read, we have dozens of applications that are received, so I want to give thanks to them. I want to thank uh, my mother and father. I come from Chicago, where we were taught to serve. Uh, people would come to our house, they needed something to eat, you got shot. You came to our house, you needed a Band-Aid. You came to our house. So it was something my mother would open her doors to do. Uh, I'm an 18-year resident of Bayview Hunters Point, so there's a lot to do. I perceive myself as a role model. Your kids come to my house, they need to borrow some tools or something because they don't have fathers in the house. Uh, as they mentioned, I'm a retired probation officer and ended in the juvenile hall. Uh, we've the theme today has been potential, human potential, we're heroes, but can you think of all the potential that's wasted at the Youth Guidance Center, at the California Youth Authority, 
at the county jail, at the state prisons and the federal prisons, all the potential that's wasted, that's lost. Uh, I want to thank uh, the nominee, Doc, Dr. Betty McGee, thank you for the nomination. And I want to thank my West Coast, my West Coast mother is here, Melody Martin. Thank you, thank you. And Dr. Martin Luther King said, we all can serve. In some capacity, we all can serve. And seeing what I see every day in Bayview Hunters Point, there's a lot of work to be done. And uh, at that, I want to say thank you. Thank you. If you can become the star of the hour, you can make every minute count. Thank you, Walter, for making every minute count. So now we have another treat. We have the African American Shakespeare Company here to do a very special reading. Please welcome them on stage. This is another excerpt from, uh, from Slavery to Freedom, and it's about the churches. Perhaps the most powerful institution in the black world was the church. Barred as they were from many areas of social and political life, African Americans turned more and more to the church for self-expression, recognition, and leadership. Nothing in their world was so completely their own as the church. Early in the century, membership grew as it had in the post-reconstruction period. As African Americans migrated to the cities, old denominations increased in membership, and new denominations sprang up. It was an exhilarating experience for blacks to participate in the ownership and control of their own institutions. It stimulated their pride and preserved the self-respect of many who had been humiliated in their efforts to adjust to American life. The lack of opportunities for African Americans to participate fully in the affairs of other institutions caused many to concentrate their energies and attention on the church. On the whole, however, it may be said that despite trends to desegregate some institutions, the black church remained what one observer called the place of refuge for black community. Thank you. Hello, cousins. Did you miss me? <laughs> Woo. You know, the one, uh, one of the um, ladies said that her husband misses her and her son misses her when she's out of the house. My husband actually pays me to get out. <laughs> you know, you got to go somewhere because you are too noisy. <laughs> now I'd like to talk about the wonderful Mr. Brian Thomas. To laugh often and much, to win the respect of intelligent people and the affection of children, to, to earn the appreciation of honest critics and endure the betrayal of false friends, to appreciate beauty, to find the best in others, to leave the world a little bit better, whether by a healthy child, a garden bath, or a redeemed social condition. To know even one life has breathed easier because you live. That is to have succeeded. That was written by Ralph Waldo Emerson, and that's what I think of when I think of the wonderful Brian Thomas. He is a native of Columbus, Ohio, and he's a graduate from Howard University, where he was a quarterback in the football team. <laughs> quarterback means masochist, because that's all I say. I went to a football game, that's all they do is jump on each other. You have to explain that to me one day. A labor relations specialist with Parsons Water in the, in the in infrastructure. He has placed over 150 young men and women in jobs. Do y'all understand that? That's like awesome. I wonder if you can hire a five-year-old, because I have one who needs a job. Many from Bayview's Hunters Point and many who have serious impediments to employment, but Brian makes employment 
employees understand that to stay on top of this placement and to make sure that they are successful, we have a young black man that is making sure that our community is successful. Ah, Shay Cousins. Ooh, that just makes me excited. He develops personal mentoring relationships with an emphasis on job retention. Because if you don't know how to retain a job, you might as well not have one. You know, because what good is a job if you're going to get fired 30 seconds after you get there? You have to know how to behave at work. I'm still trying now, but I got a job, but it's shaky sometimes. As a result of his work, lives have turned around and money has funneled into the community. Each new job has a ripple effect among the families involved. Do you understand that, cousins? When money comes in, it has a ripple effect for everybody involved. Because kids can't learn when they're hungry. They can. He is married and bringing up his wife's sister, three teenage kids. Now that blows me away. Because you know what? If you have a teenager, you understand the extent of suffering. <laughs> You know, because you, if you understand parenting, you know you can't do a kid a favor. They've got a sense of entitlement that transcends the universe. And he's got three teenagers that aren't his own? Ah, oh, shit. <laughs> Brian's father, Donald U, U. Thomas, who recently made his transition, was a major influence in his life. And he is still alive, your dad is still alive. His love, his affection, his genius for bringing up a wonderful son exists forever. Ashe cousins! Ashe. All right. His words of wisdom for Brian were, if you can't be a national leader, be a leader in your own community. Please welcome Brian Thompson. <laughs> Um, first of all, I'd like to um, thank God and Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. I, I didn't want to be like Kurt Franklin, get a award and didn't thank God. I feel that, you know, anytime you do something for God, you, you, you need to thank him. And keep him, you know, at, at hand because Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. Next, I'd like to thank um, someone that is very special to me, the one that nominated me. Uh, Ms. Diana Rathbone, she, uh, and I see uh, Pansy, her friend. Um, we started together, I work for the city, uh, I work for uh, the water department, PUC, uh, the PUC. Um, I was assigned to uh, Parsons, uh, Bechtel, worked through Parsons, Bechtel, uh, Jim Jefferson, uh, the MBE company, and I was assigned uh, the Human Rights Commission to, as a diversity manager, but that title was changed. And I worked with Diana, who was the senior compliance officer for the PUC. And I can never thank her uh, enough for uh, mentoring me on this program. We started with uh, business outreach, and then she had a vision. She had a vision that maybe, you know, with the additional fundings from the San Francisco Water Department, in the city of San Francisco that we would uh, see through the contract compliance, uh, the program, which is called First Source, see if we can place local residents from San Francisco on city contracts. Um, with that, a lot of protests on the HRC, uh, the former director gave her the go ahead and she created a system and she showed a lot of passion and I was able to benefit from that because when you, um, as Dr. Martin Luther King went through his struggles in Atlanta, it wasn't just him. He had a lawyer, he had a judge there working with him. And so uh, I was able, I was fortunate to uh, work with her. What we did was any contract that exceeded a million dollars, we made ensure that they had a San Francisco residence, you know, under the, uh, under the PUC or other departments. And Diana would sit in the room and there was a young lady named Verma who would do the certified payroll. It was the three of us and we created something and we put guys out there, they get fired 
and then we would screen them better. But what we did was we reached back and, you know, through her influence, uh, I was able to go out there, because she's from England, right? <laughs> and most of your contract contractors are Irish. So the England-Ireland relationship, you know, it, it, that was something else. I mean, you know, so I, and then, you know, she'll let them know she's having a bad day. You know, and they'll back off. It's, it's, it's strange because that's the relationship in Europe. Okay, well, with that, um, Diana retired. It, you know, she, I worked with her for three years. And then during that process, um, uh, Sophie Maxwell came up with the idea to uh, create City Build with Gavin Newsom. And through that, she did the preliminary. But one of the things that she ensured, and also I want to thank uh, my general manager, uh, Susan Leal, Tony Irons, who kept me funded over at the PUC, and most of all, uh, Harlan Kelly, the assistant general manager. You know, Harlan is a beautiful person. And the commission, and Commissioner Brooks, um, he gave me a ticket to go home. My father just passed on October the 31st. And he got over 400 people scholarships to college. Matter of fact, the athletic director of Ohio State was one of his uh, protégés. And so um, I got to thank my wife. The boys would kill me. And <laughs> yeah, you know. And so what I want to say to you is this. Uh, stand up, uh, Charles, Keith, and James. Stand up. Uh, they. Charles probably didn't start school till he was nine years old, and I got involved. He's in the ninth grade. He, he's playing ball, and Keith is in the eighth, and James is in the sixth. They got to read, read the Bible every day. And I learned some of that from Diana with her daughter and her relationship. We went to uh, Columbia University. We had that relationship. But most of all, I want to uh, say that we had, right now, we may have 30 guys working from Hunter's Point. Or all over the city, 40. That's been working over two years. Uh, a lot of times the contractor want to play games, but a lot of times I got the one guy get fired, and I'll take him. You know, I go out on Fridays to all the job sites. We go to pre-con meetings, and the contractors. It's kind of easy because I did the outreach. We helped them make money. So I took that niche and said, Hey, you know me. I'll get you some good guys. One of the problems is, uh, you know, from a black perspective. You know, they all they come up with false assumptions that you don't want to work, that you you know you're not capable of work. And so what we did was we had to create a system, and the system was to motivate them, and to reach back and teach them how to effectively work 40 hours a week. So you know we have our city build academy, and and and, and I've been acknowledged by the mayor, I've been acknowledged by everybody. And, you know, Rhonda Simmons, I'm, I'm in a unique situation because I don't care about that. I just want to make it happen. Right. All I care about because they're making, I think we did a breakdown. I think I got 30 guys that's been with us at $25 an hour that worked over two years. And, you know, they got, you know, we started with, with contractors. And, I, I, and I'm on 3rd Street on Friday. I'm at YCD. I'm with Jesse Mason. But what I want to say to you this is education is the key. And, you know, we must reach back. And I've never seen a leader come from another race, but a, re a leader come from within his own race. And that we have a responsibility to help these kids step up for the future. And I'm blessed that I had a father that made me get an education. And education, once you get that degree, as the old people say, they can never take it for you. That's what we have to do. That's a man on the move. And you know they used to have that song by ZZ Top, every girl crazy about a well-dressed man. There's some well-dressed men here. I want you to give yourselves an applause. There ain't nothing more beautiful than a black man. Ashe cousins, y'all act like y'all don't know what I'm talking about. The next awardee is Dr. Alberta Rose Eberhardt. Unfortunately, she is in New York with her son right now and can't be able to attend. However, you're in for a treat because we're gonna have her up on the screen. So please, take a few minutes and watch the screen and then I will introduce her. Thank you.
was fast. <laughs> Dr. Alberta Rose Eberhardt, she has a doctorate in education. She has a, a master's in dance from Mills College. Yeah, amen. She has a master in divinity from the Graduate Theological Union. She is a reverend at St. Paul's Tabernacle Baptist Church. She is the master teacher at the Catherine Dunham Technique. She's a dance professor, another tireless woman who does not sleep. At San Francisco State, she is the founder and the director of the Village Dancers, which sends dancers out in the community to teach free classes to children in San Francisco. Ah, Shay, did you hear me? I said free classes. She is the wife and mother of a talented son, and she was nominated by Kathleen Franklin. And we're going to have Minister N N Natalia Johnson come and accept the award on her behalf. Please welcome her to the stage. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to the San Francisco Public Library staff and administrators, to the elders here in our midst, to the legends being recognized and the future legends sitting in the back in red, and the three young men over here to my left. This joy that I have, the world didn't give it and the world can never take it away, is what echoes in the spirit of my mentor, Reverend Dr. Alberta Rose, Alberta Jean Rose Landry Eberhardt. <laughs> Have to get it right. A virtuous woman indeed. At San Francisco State University where she has taught for over 35 years, she has trained your dance teachers how to teach. And she teaches the gospel choir. At San Francisco State, they know her as Dr. Rose. At St. Paul Tabernacle Baptist Church, she's known as Reverend Alberta Eberhardt, where she's led Christian education and even inspired us to praise dance. Uh, she was praise dancing in the late 60s, early 70s, when praise dance wasn't even recognized as a, a way of ministry. In the dance world, they know her as Bird uh, for her dance moves, as you, you've seen. Um, she's the director of certification. Under, uh, she was appointed by her mentor, um, Catherine Dunham, who recently passed this year. She's a mother of two, William and Joshua. She's actually away now with Joshua in New York, touring colleges, uh, creative arts schools. And she's a wife and caretaker of our pastor emeritus, uh, Reverend Arthur A.J. Eberhardt Sr. Uh, she, if she was here, she would be in tears right now. She calls it a seed that's just inside of her, and it's her way of caring. Um, but she is thankful. She wishes she could have been here, but family calls, and, um, and she, she would like to thank you. Thank you. Let us remember, cousins, love. Let us remember love and to each his own. Love makes the serpent equal to the God. It makes us larger than our flesh and bone, and it lifts us from the jail of time and sod. Look at each other, turn around and say, let us remember love. Let us remember love. Hey, man, Ashe. And now I'd like to welcome again the African American Shakespeare Company to read the good word. Come on down. Again, this is a reminder that we do have this book at the San Francisco Public Library. So um, 
we cannot do it justice just by reading these selections, but we do hope that you will look into it for yourselves. Looking back on almost four centuries of residence in the Western world, African Americans could correctly visualize themselves from the beginning as an integral part of the struggle for freedom. Frequently, they were active participants in the valiant warfare to destroy bigotry, repression, and subjugation. They had also been important factors in the ageless struggle between freedom and slavery. They had been the nation's constant reminders of the imperfection of its social order and the immorality of its human relationships. They had witnessed a nation dedicated to liberty move toward the brink of destruction in the struggle to settle the question of freedom. The rejections that they had suffered gave them, gave them a perspective and an objectivity that others had greater difficulty in achieving. They could therefore point out more clearly than some others the weaknesses that seemed to be inherent in Western civilization. They could tell the United States, as the National Urban League did at the close of World War II, back of all that is planned or achieved is the fact that henceforth it is one world or none. If America's role was to lead the world towards peace and international understanding, African Americans had a special function to perform in carrying forward the struggle for freedom at home for the sake of America's role, and abroad for the sake of the survival of the world. Was that beautiful? That was beautiful and so eloquently read. Let me give it one more hand. You know, um, I, my father was in the military when I was um, a, a little girl, and I wasn't raised in the United States. I was raised in Tokyo, Japan. And when I moved to Texas in 1970, I had a real language problem because nobody in Texas spoke English. <laughs> but in the meantime, I, did, I, wasn't cult, I wasn't culturated. I did not know anything about being American. I didn't know about anything about being black, and I was kind of lost. But you know what? I found salvation, acceptance, intelligent, love, and approval in the library. Because right. that was the only place that I could go to where I didn't get in trouble. Because you see, I have, my mouth was like, like a runaway train. I was so enthusiastic about stuff that I had never seen before that it always came out wrong, always. And my grandmother was born in 1896, and my grandfather was born in 1900. And nothing in their past prepared them for me and their future. <laughs> but I, I did want to step and acknowledge the, the library, because when I go to Amazon.com and Borders.com, I find a book that I want to read. And then I go to the library and get it. But let me tell you, the library's got it set up so if you want a book, you can order it, and they send you an email when it's there. You don't have to go to the library anymore. They've got this thing that's called eBooks, and you can order it, and it comes to your computer. You don't have to take off your robe. <laughs> Brush your teeth, comb your hair, and you can go to the library. The whole world, all the intelligence, all the information for you to not become happy, to but be happy itself is in a library. Amen. Yeah. And I would like to thank each and every one of you cousins because I love you from the bottom of my heart. And in fact, if my husband wasn't a police officer, I'd probably be stalking you all right now. <laughs> But since I won't go for, but I did want to appreciate that you, you came and you stayed. And I want to appreciate that every single one of your hearts is the heart of a hero. And I say to each and every one of you, Ashe. Thank you so much.
I just have a few closing remarks. I just want to say special thank you to Veronica. She makes this process such a joy every year. I don't know where we would be, Veronica, without your wonderful words every year. I'd like to take this time also uh, to thank the National Council of Negro Women who are providing us with some refreshments today, along with Red Door Catering. So I'm going to invite all of you to come over to the Latino Hispanic Room for some refreshments. I'd like to thank the nominating committee, Dave Schwabi and his staff, Eric Mataro, Troy Alexander, the African American Interest Committee, Stuart Shaw, Linda Brooks Burton, Janetta Jackson. Yeah. I'd like to thank Mrs. Pa Marion Pavis and Penny Pavis, who was sitting, who welcomed everyone at the back of the auditorium. Reggie Stevenson, a special thank you to our city librarian, Lu Luis Herrera and to the Friends and Foundation for their financial support, which makes this program possible every year. A special thank you to the supervisors who are here with us today, uh, Supervisor Maxwell and Ald Amiano. Amiano, and to Marsha Snyder and her staff with programming exhibit, Sherry from the Public Re Relations Office, and anybody else, is, if I hope I didn't forget anyone, if I did, it's a matter of the heart, Okay, so I just want to say thank you to all of our winners, all those who nominated them, all those who came and accepted. Our community would not be a, the community that it is today without you. So I want to say thank you to everyone. And we will see you back here next year for our 20th anniversary of our Unsung Heroes. So thank you for coming. And uh, also I forgot the young ladies who did the praise dance for S.R. Martin. Thank you, ladies. Thank you, thank you, thank you.